a surgeon, a flesh and blood artist, trying to talk about pregnancy and trying to link that with technology. Bear with me as I try to connect these three dots over the next few minutes. Through all of mankind's history, pregnancy was a mysterious time as far as knowledge about the baby was known. There was a lot of anticipation, a lot of guesswork, and the only technology available was the midwife's hand or your doctor's hand. In the span of one generation, this has changed radically because we now have tools which are getting better and better. We have ultrasound scans, we have MRI scans, and we have multiple invasive tests where suddenly the newborn baby is no longer a mystery and we're able to look deeper and deeper and with great detail into not just the, the, the baby as a whole, but individual organs and individual cells as we look at it. And it's part of the inevitable advance of medicine. I'm sure we've seen images of babies sucking their thumbs in the womb, babies smiling and babies waving, and these are very hot warming. And of course, the highlight today in most of our hospitals is to create a 4D ultrasound portrait of the baby and give a framed picture of this to the excited parents. And the universal response is, aww, as the new generation keeps saying. Boy, am I just glad that my parents never got a chance to look at this face before I was born. <laughs> Wouldn't have stood a chance there. We as human beings are designed to respond differently to what we see and what we know in our heads. And Shakespeare said it beautifully. He said, if you can look into the seeds of time and pick out and say which grain will grow and which grain will not, speak then unto me, because then you would be able to actually predict the future. Thanks to the advancement in imaging and in testing techniques, in a way, we are already in this place where you're able to look at the future if only nine months in advance. The Ethiopian famine, the great Ethiopian famine of 1984 was tragic, but it was vastly ignored by most of the world for some time until the BBC report by Michael Burke, which brought across stark images of starving and dying children. And this led to an immediate emotional connect. And all over the world, there was this huge response of aid, culminating, of course, in that fantastic performance of Live Aid. As was said of Live Aid, because humans were able to see the suffering and they responded, they said, forced to look hell in the face, humanity did not turn a blind eye. And I think this is a great trait which we humans persist with. Unfortunately, when it comes to be able to look into the womb at that unborn baby and at the defects that the baby may have, this urge to do something or to try to correct that something can lead to us intervening all too often, and sometimes with disastrous consequences. As a surgeon, don't get me wrong, I'm very indebted to this technology and to the imaging and the tests, which allow us to look at the baby and plan our treatment and then to set the way for us to work. However, I have to keep in mind that there are three options when a baby is diagnosed to have something wrong. Option one, is to transfer the mother and the baby together before the baby is born, using the mother as an ambulance to a center where the baby may get good care after the baby is born. In case there is a complex malformation which cannot be corrected, then termination of the pregnancy is offered. And rarely, in some centers, they're able to operate in the womb a fascinating advance again. However, the problem is, in situations in countries where regulation is not as strict and the birth rate is high, the offer of terminating a baby who may not be born perfectly is fast becoming the number one option. And this is dangerous and this is scary. We are able to look at these organs with such great precision and that is power. That knowledge is total power over that unborn life. Yes, Knowledge is power, but is this much power good? Especially when you give this power to a species that is so dangerous, that is us humans. We've seen what we can do when we are given too much power. When we look for perfection, when we look at these babies who are born with these malformations and say no, we mustn't forget, if you look back at history, 
that most dictators, most mass murderers, most rapists, and most terrorists probably had perfect bodies with perfect organs on an ultrasound scan. Going by today's standards of perfection in the baby who's yet to be born, we might have lost all of these individuals because some of them are blind, some of them are deaf, some of them are both blind and deaf, some don't have limbs, and yet they were able to create such wonderful contributions to our life which have been there, which today, unfortunately, most of them wouldn't have stood a chance if we knew what they were going through. And in this rush for this perfection, we are now moving towards eradicating, eradicating babies with imperfections, with structural imperfections. And there couldn't be a bigger tragedy than that. This is leading us on to a highway, which I'd like to call the eugenic highway, because suddenly we are now moving towards a place where we can actually fine tune the kind of baby that we want. We've read recently that this journey has already started. And genetic advances are moving in a place wherein we'll soon be able to control many, many facets of the babies who are yet to be born. We'll go to that in a minute. Coming back to the search for imperfections. Am I a stick in the mud technophobe? Am I a Luddite who's saying that we shouldn't have such uh, technology? Not at all. Absolutely not at all. But we must always temper that with our human and moral judgment. One of the best voices of caution has come from the father of fetal intervention, the man who was a pioneer in intervening in the fetus and spent much the better part of his career pushing for this intervention. But now he is one of the best voices where he says that we should all maintain a skepticism about fetal treatment. Now, another fallout of this, of knowing this, that these babies can be terminated, is that it is removing the incentive for us to find cure. Because if a baby has a problem, until now, the focus was on trying to find a solution for that. But suddenly now we have the power to lose the baby. And this, I fear, will lead us to dropping cure as an option for some of these uh, babies. Until now, doctors had an objective, saying, how do I eliminate this disease? Suddenly, for the first time in human history, we have the situation where another choice is there, which is not where I, do I eliminate the disease, but it is where can I eliminate this patient? Because for the first time, we're actually looking at throwing away the patient because the disease is there. And I think that is the danger of throwing the baby out with the dirty water in a real practical sense and not in a theoretical or figurative way in which we use this statement. This is the first time in history that we actually are able to do this. And I think that is what we need to be aware of. Another fallout of technology during pregnancy and knowing so much is the fact that Genetically, we are getting better and better, and one day it will come that with just one single cell, which can be accessed through an amniocentesis, there is the knowledge possible that I may be able to predict the height, a desired height for my child maybe, a desired complexion for my child maybe, maybe an IQ which fits into a Mensa club, and nothing less will I accept for my child, or maybe even a preferred gender for my child. Ah. Now we're talking practical, because this we've already seen. As a race in our country and some other countries, we've seen what power we have when we see what the sex of the baby is and the horror of how we respond to that. We have killed thousands and thousands of them merely for the abnormality of being born a sex which I did not want. When we are aware of this, we know that all that I mentioned is a reality which is waiting to happen. And then now we have the tools and we have the imaging for a brand new holocaust where we might be able to lose many more babies than ever in the past. And that is partly where this eugenic argument is so scary for us. But let's go to what the experts are saying. The experts in this field are the obstetricians and gynecologists. The American college in their guidelines said that their accuracy rate of finding anomalies starts from a mere 13% to 85%. 13% to 85%.
and at a very high false positive rate. And so they themselves said, I think we are causing more hardship than benefit in this field. Now when the experts are that honest, I think it behoves society to take these things with a pinch of salt. Where is the connection between these three dots that I was talking about? My 360 degree moment. Back in 1969, I was born with three life-threatening birth anomalies myself. 1969, a time when medical science and imaging and tools were much more rudimentary than they are today. Thank God for that. I was born with these, and a team of dedicated surgeons and nurses back then believed that this baby could make it. They toiled through seven surgeries in my infancy, and they pulled me through. I was born with a, an intestine which was not joined, an absent anus, both my kidneys being large, and a spina bifida. But they didn't see it as that. They saw a child who had potential, and then I came through. I think I'm alive because of two reasons. One, they didn't know I was coming with this whole baggage. And two, they were just determined to save that life, and they saw potential in this life. Why am I stressing the word potential? Because not only have I made it and alive and breathing, I had the opportunity and, and the blessing to train as a surgeon who operates on babies who are born with the exact same malformations that I was born with. And I think that is a great privilege, and I was blessed with that. I'm paying my debt back to society. I'm a productive part of the society in spite of this baggage that I came. Has it been easy? No. I still live sometimes with a leaky bladder, a leaky bowel. I had mental health issues. And of course, if you ask my family, I'm a very difficult person to be around. But still, I'm fully human and fully alive in spite of all of these problems. My fear is that babies who are today being born with similar malformations as myself are being killed by the advanced medical science. I'm just lucky that God didn't schedule my birth in the year 2019, and this scheduled it in 1969. And I think we have to take the word medical advancement with a pinch of salt when it comes to us losing our ability to care compassionately for someone who may be different. In this, my idea today is that, yes, while we go along with the advancements, we are there, not to forget that our moral and ethical judgment needs to come with us at the front of this technology, guiding us away from the race to be a eugenically superior being, and also to keep our hearts open as doctors to know that we do not know enough, and to be able to say this to our patients and to our families to say medical science doesn't know enough, and that we must not sacrifice our compassionate ability to cure or if you are not able to cure, to care. We shouldn't sacrifice this at the altar of a technological advancement or of statistics or of guidelines. Let us give life a chance. Thank you.